we're going to be discussing parallel and perpendicular lines here. That's why I like this meme from the forever alone, right? Parallel lines, they never meet. All right, parallel lines. The important thing about being parallel is that they have the same gradient. So they, they do never meet, it's sort of like this, right? But let me actually give you a diagram or a drawing or something. So let's just pretend I have uh, this line, let's say that one right there. And I will, just to make it exactly the same, I'll try to do copy and I'll try to do paste. There we go. I should pretend so I have these two lines right here. Maybe like that. Make it a little bit longer. Yeah, something like that. All right, so these two lines are here. Let's say they're parallel lines. What is similar about them, or how do the equations of them go? Well, let's just pretend it was like, um, I don't know, let's call it y1. Let's call it y1 equals, and let's pretend it was like, like it's got a positive gradient. So every one I go to the right, I go up. So maybe it's like 2x. Let's pretend this meets at like uh, 4 maybe. So 2x plus 4. Well, this other line right here, this y2, I could call that, um, well, it's going to have the same gradient here. So maybe it'll be 2x, but it'll have a different y-intercept. So maybe I'll call it uh, 2. So the important thing here is that if we describe this little gradient right here as m1, like the gradient of the first graph, this here's the gradient of the second graph, maybe I'll call it m2. The important thing is that m1 equals m2. This is the key thing to parallel graphs, okay? So parallel lines. They have a different y-intercept, but they have the same gradient. That is the key thing. And this right here you should memorize because it's not on your formula booklet, okay? This, I mean, some people just think it's obvious. Yeah, of course they're the same, they're parallel. But in case not, then there you go. So let's do this example here. We have a straight line in general form. That's not the most useful form, is it? We want to know what's an equation of a line that's parallel to it in the form y equals mx plus c. I think the first step, a good first step, will be to get into um, y equals mx plus c form. I think that'll be more useful, right? just with this first graph here. So let's let's just try to do that, so the first equation. So let me try to do that here. So I've got 4x plus 3y minus 6 equals 0. I want to get my y by itself, so I'll say 3y. Now, I can move my 4x to the right. It becomes a minus 4x. And I move my minus 6 to the right. It becomes a plus 6. All right. Now, if I want to get y by itself, then I would divide both sides by 3. So I have minus 4 over 3x. And I would have um, plus 6 over 3 which, by the way, that would be, let's see, minus 4 over 3. Um, and then I would have um, x plus 2. Now, this is my first equation. This is my, like, y1, which means this value right here, then, is my m1. But if I know that they're parallel, do you remember what happens with parallel lines? Parallel lines means m1 equals m2, just like I wrote up here. That's the key thing here. So because of that, then, I can just make myself any old equation I want, as long as I have my m2 equals this one. So I'm going to call my new equation, let's say y2, it's going to be um, minus 4 thirds x, and then it doesn't matter what I put here, as long as it's not the same. So I could put here anything. I could put anything I want there. So what could I put there? It could be anything. It could be, you know, 3. I could put in, you know, minus 5. I could put in 2. I can put in anything I want here. So really what they'd be looking for, if this is an exam question, they'd be looking for as long as you have the first gradient, as long as this m2 equals m1, so to speak, then they don't care about what y-intercept is. So they would actually stipulate that in the, formula, in the um, uh, mark scheme. So there we go. That's how we actually uh, deal with this first one right here, okay? What if we want to actually do perpendicular lines? Those are ones where they're 90 degrees to each other. That's what it means to be perpendicular. That's why I like this perpendicular. Get it? The cow. God. All right, so I think it's really cute. So perpendicular, sometimes we use this mathematical symbol like this. It means they're 90 degrees to each other. That's what it means to be perpendicular. Now, just like before with parallel lines, we had m1 equals m2 for two different graphs. We have one right here as well. We know that m1 
times m2, this is the important one, equals minus 1. This one right here is super and duper important. Okay, I would say for sure this is an important one. and For sure memorize this. Or at least know how to do it. Another trick is to say um, it's the negative reciprocal is another way to say it. Uh, I'll show you that in a second, why that is. So negative reciprocal. What I mean by that is if you want to know m2, what do you do? Well, it's going to be minus 1 over m1. See that if I want to get m2 by itself. So what do I do? Whatever gradient I have, I flip it. That's the reciprocal, and I do a negative. So really, that's the sort of the useful version. So if we want to find an equation of a line that's perpendicular to this graph below, and it passes through the point 2, 1. So here's our first graph here. Maybe I'll call it y1, just so I sort of know what I'm doing here. I'm going to have a new equation called y2. All right, well, first of all, I guess it's important to know what happens actually with, uh, let's find y1. I need it in the form, you know, y equals mx plus c, because that'll be a lot easier to deal with it than I can know what to do. In fact, it'll be y1 equals m1 x plus c. So let's actually see if we can figure this out. So what is my y-intercept? Do I know that? I do know that it's 1. See that? It crosses that 1. So I know for sure it's got a plus 1 here. Now what's my gradient? My gradient isn't quite as straightforward. We have to do a little bit of thinking on that. So gradient, let's see, m1. What will it be equal to? Well, i got to pick two points on the graph. I may as well pick this first point here. That looks like it matches really nicely. And it looks like 1, 3 also matches. If I do that, I can make a little dotted line like this. This could be my delta y. This could be my delta x. And m1 equals delta y over delta x. I rise over run, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now what is this value right here? Well, it goes, let's see, from 1 to 3, so it goes up by 2, and it goes over by 1. So I know that my gradient then is 2. Does that make sense? And then my gradient is 2. You can also look at it, go over 1 right, up 2. Therefore, the gradient is 2. Now why is this important? Well, I know what I can do with this now. I know this right here is m1. But now I'm going to use this whole idea. Remember that m1, m2 equals minus 1. Why do I do that? Because now I know what m2 is. m2 is going to be this number, which is 2. I'm going to flip it and change the sign. That's how I do that, right? I get m2. That's because this is a 2, right? 2 times m2 equals minus 1, so there you go. Now I can rewrite, or I can write at least, my equation then for y2. So y2 is then is going to be, well, minus one half x plus, now I don't know what to put here. Here's the problem. See, what do I do here? I want to find this, ah, but I know something about it. I know it passes through the point two, one. That's the important part here. Look. So they told us this information. So we have this point right here. I'm going to take that. I'm going to use it. I know that when x equals two, I know that y equals one on this thing. In other words, two, one, it passes through this point right here. Well, if that's the case, then what's going to happen? See, it's going to have to be hopefully something like this. We'll see where it crosses. I'm going to use that fact. I'll call this C for now. Then I'll put in what Y2 is. Y2 is going to be 1 minus 1 half times X, which is 2 plus C. Now my 2s are going to cancel out, which is kind of nice. So I have minus 1 plus C. So C is going to be equal to Let's see, uh, 1, this minus 1 comes over here, so 1 plus 1, which is just 2. So because of that, then I'm going to say I know my whole equation now. My new equation is y2 equals minus 1 half x, and I can say plus 2. Now I'm finished. I'm done. I've solved it. If we weren't sure what to do here, we can always look at the graph on our calculator if we wanted to. If I just open that up. Let me do a graph of this, and let's just see if I can do it here. So I want a graph of, um, well, this first one, 2x plus 1. Let's see if that works. So 2x plus 1. Let's just see if that's reasonable. Does that look like this one? Sure does. At 1, it's at 3. So yeah, that looks good. Now let's also graph, so I'll press tab. Let's also graph this new one, which was minus, in parentheses here, or bracket, I mean, it's a nice fraction, it's 1 half x, and I say plus 2. Now let's see what happens then. Does it look 90 degrees to this one? Yeah, it does. Does it pass through the point 2, 1? It sure does. 
So that's why this actually makes sense. And maybe I'll even draw it here. So it actually goes like, I'll draw it. So I've sort of made it a mess now, but it will. It goes something like, something like that. There we go. Just to extend it a little bit further. Right? Something like that. I mean, it's not a perfect drawing, but uh, there we go. So there's my Y. Whoa. There's my Y2. So when do we actually use this stuff? Well, lots in geometry, when we think about parallel versus perpendicular. In physics, we have all these things in electromagnetism. We use like these hand rules and these weird things. In construction, it's important to get things parallel or perpendicular. Those are just some of the examples I could think of. But at least mathematically, here's how we can do it.